Hello, One Book, One Norristown community. I'm Sharon Mock, and I serve on the Norristown Area School District Board of Directors. I will be reading the first part of Chapter 10 of the Rain Carries novel, The Price of a Child. As a reminder, where we left off last week, here's a brief recap of Chapter 9. In Chapter 9, Waiting, Mercer is reunited with Maddie, Etta, and the Quicks. She urges her children to keep a written record of their lives. Prudence Randall approaches Mercer about making a lecture tour about her experiences through New England. Because of her uncertain status in the recent, as yet undecided, court case, Mercer delays her decision. She moves from Aunt B's shed to Harriet's room, rooms and Mrs. Becker's house. By day, she works for the Quicks. By night, Harriet helps her further her education. This chapter contains use of the N-word, and I have chosen not to read that word aloud. Chapter 10, Strong as Death. Then came the judgment. In 1847, Pennsylvania's legislature had clearly repealed slave owners' permission to carry slaves through the state. About that, that there was no question, and from the testimony, the jury agreed with the defense that no abduction had occurred. All six men, therefore, were acquitted of riot. The two who had restrained Pryor from grabbing Mercer were found guilty of assault and battery, but just barely. Although, as a rule, blacks drew severe prison sentences, these men received one week in jail. Judge Wells, meanwhile, found himself more and more amiable to discussing terms with Williamson's lawyers, although the vigilance man offered no fresh information. Wells, after a show of demanding specific new language in his petition, in his petition purged him of contempt. He was never tried. Mercer and her children were free. The abolitionists and the suffragettes had held small, temperate celebrations for Williamson and Still. Leary of too much public display in Philadelphia, Mercer declined to visit her rescuers. Instead, she bought two white handkerchiefs, embroidered them with the date and her old initials, and sent one to each man. The Quicks held their own small party and invited Nig Nag. Mercer served, from, served him dinner and thanked him heartily. If it hadn't been for you, boy, we, would, we could still be slaves to that man. You'd be over in Nicaragua somewhere with a distinguished captain, you know who, United States Minister Plenipotentiary near the island. <coughs> Excuse me, of Nicaragua, ha, huh. could have fever and plague and God knows what else diseases. Probably one of y'all be dead. Della served ham and duck and fish. They ate and drank until all they could do was sit back and digest. Nick Nag left just as the sun went down. There was no moon. The Quicks had given him some money. He stopped on Locust at a place he knew and the man threw him out. Then he walked back to Juniper Street, next to the alley where he stayed, to a whorehouse to get a drink. The owner of the house, Charade, would not let him in the fancy parlor, but sometimes she gave him a drink on the back porch where he could go get in out of the weather. She did tonight, handing him a quarter full bottle of water gin, since he had brought money. He drank some he drank some until he felt nice and easy. He had to pee and he could still walk, so he weaved his way towards the alley and let his body do what it wanted. Someone in a yard was saying train as he passed, and he let out a high-pitched choo-choo and laughed because it felt so good and there was no one to stop him. Back on the porch, he took deep swigs from the bottle. He thought about Mercer serving him dinner. She bent over him. The door to Charade's kitchen was closed. He was alone in the dark, 
so no one could see him or hear him. He slipped his hand inside his pants and began to rub himself. Then he grabbed with his fist and pulled up and down. Mercer's nearness had excited him this night, but his mind jumped back to Abby Ann, whom he really wanted, always. She was so pretty. Her butt bustled up high, and she swung it when she when she walked, and her skin was so white and smooth at the neck, and her mouth was so pink. Suppose he could make that pink mouth suck anywhere he wanted. He stiffened and came in his pants and passed out quickly. In an hour, the boy who cleaned up the charade for charade came to kick Nick Nag, take the empty bottle back, and send him on his way. Nick Nag felt so good that he didn't even notice the slave catchers, one white, one black, a cynically matched couple, salt and pepper. Keller knew better than to send two white men into the alleys where escaped slaves lived with free blacks, and he did not trust two Negroes, no matter how hardened, on this mission alone together. Usually, Kerr kept these two men apart and chastised them to keep them from damaging the merchandise. But this time, he told them to rough up the idiot boy and take his most more valuable friends, Jack and Bobo who'd been out bragging about Nig Nag's unlikely service to the under, in the Underground Railroad. Nig Nag himself wasn't worth smuggling south, and he was too easy to identify, but his beating would send a message from Pryor. That's why the fastidious ambassador would, go, would get for his $60, and down to Georgia, Jack and Bobo would go for $1,000 wholesale. In the room, Jack lay tied and gagged on the floor, and the two men held Bobo in the corner. Nick Nag wanted to turn fast and run. He saw himself hitting his butt and laughing as he did to leave the room quickly, but he couldn't move. Shame on him. He drunk too much whiskey again. Two men held tight to Bobo, wrestled him to the floor, and tied him. Then one rushed at Nick Nag with something, what, with something, what? It hit him and fell down. The man stepped on him. His foot caught in Nick clothes and he rolled over. Man tripped and rolled over him like a train. Choo-choo! He didn't mean to say it. Oh, shit. That was Bobo. Nick knew his voice. The man kicked Nick to make him be still. Dull, hard pain. I'm a towel, he burst out. The man kicked him again. Sucked out his wind. Nig Nag couldn't breathe, but he breathed a little and it hurt so bad, so bad he cried. The floor sloped and he was rolling towards the wall. Leave him alone. I'm a fuck you to shut you up. Who said Nick Nag couldn't see? He hurt so bad inside. He heard the heavy thuds of their bodies. No marks, Nick N word. I'm not going to leave no marks. Thuds and thuds. Old Bobo was crying. Couldn't because Bobo was a bad man. They couldn't make Bobo cry. Choo choo. Chugga, 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 chugga. Nig Nag couldn't stop. Nig Nag, shh. The hurt was so bad. He crawled to the door. He had to get out. They dragged Jack and Bobo towards the door, banging, banged into, and banged into Nig Nag. What's this? They banged his head into the door. Old rotten wood door. It gave way. They were gone. Nig Nag kept crawling. They were paddling upstairs to their bedrooms when standby began to bark. Tyree heard they were him from across the alley and opened the back door. Nick Nag lay on the ground, sticky with blood that had dripped from his nose onto his shirt. He was covered with mud and dirt and his face had been hit badly. His eyes were shut. He could not talk much. It hurt too much to breathe in. He told them what he could. Ephraim, he, who had been on his way out, suspected Nig Nag of lying. Are you sure that it was the slave catchers and not just some of your friends who wanted your bottle? Nig Nag rolled his eyes at Ephraim and rolled them back again to the ceiling, too hurt to be afraid. Kick, fuck, shit, fuck him, boo boo, fuck, fuck, he began to cough and sputter. Oh no, Della said, oh no, I can't have that in my house. Get him out, Ephraim ordered no one in particular. Wait, Ephraim, Tyree said. Yes? 
I'll help you take him to the church for safekeeping. Ha! Slave catchers, slave catcher men, Nignag said. They made Bobo cry. We've never had slave catchers go into one of our houses. They wouldn't dare, Della said. Why not? What's to stop them? They don't even have street lamps there, said Tyree. Look at him. Mercer put a wet rag to his lips and squeezed in a drop. Shit, fuck, fuck, fuck. Nignag could only whisper and spit. Oh, Lord, Mercer said. Is that blood coming out of his mouth? Probably busted his tongue or something, Tyrese took Nignag's jaw and cupped palm and squeezed both his lips. Two teeth had been knocked out. So come on, we'll take him to church. He's had his time living off the church, Ephraim said. Reverend Brown let him live there for months, and he defiled the sanctuary. He stole things. Just for a while, Christ man, look at him. Mercer watched bloody saliva bubbling from the side of Nignag's mouth. Fuck, 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 fuck. She could barely hear him now. She washed his face. The water seemed to revive him. Choo, choo. Shit. Della's hands, head snapped around. Oh, no, sir. Not here. Mercer asked Della for some ale and water. Della inclined her head to the basement door. Mercer went downstairs, drew some ale from the keg, and added water. She offered it to Nignag, who sucked on the cup noisily. Tyree, meanwhile, had cornered Ephraim. He leaned against the wall with his elbow next to Ephraim's head. So, for another thing, we really need permission from the reverend. Other ne'er-dwellers and idiots from the church lodged routinely in the basement went to sleep and stayed put. But not Nignag. He had sneaked around and climbed up through a loose board. He broke the board. Then he curled up in the choir loft and masturbated there and fell asleep. It wasn't something to say in front of women. Let me talk to you alone, Ephraim said to Tyree. No, no, Tyree said. He stepped into the shed kitchen and brought back Roland's old coat and hung it by the back door. Tyree, Della said, I like the coat. We used it for the privy. And doesn't it come in handy? Abby Ann entered the kitchen, trailing her shawls and rubbing her eyes. We gave him Roland's old clothes before. I'm sure he got the brown coat with the black patches. Might as well throw it down a rat hole, Della said irritably. She, she could see Tyree was determined. Well, go ahead and take it. You must go back to bed, Ephraim said. Abby Ann smiled with ostentatious Wanness and left the kitchen. Ephraim, said Tyree, you'll see it when you'll see to it that my mother gets her coat back, won't you? If I have to rip it off him myself, Mrs. Quick, Ephraim laughed and took the old coat with a flourish. Will you call the doctor for him? Mercer asked. Every now and then, a new trickle of blood dripped out from Nignag's nose or mouth. She kept thinking of how the boy had grinned at her when she hissed out his her story to him at Blood Dog's Hotel. Ephraim did not answer. Instead, he went to wrap Nignag in the coat. Don't fret about the boy, Ephraim said to her. He was using his reverend Ephraim voice. I'll take care of him. Mercer appealed to Tyree. Very few white doctors you can trust after a thing like this, he said. If it was really with slave catchers, you mean. Did they take Bobo and Jack too, you say? Tyree asked Nignag. Fucked him, beat him up, banged my head in the door. But why do all that, Ephraim wondered, if you want to sell people back into slavery? Bobo and Jack can take it. They'll notice you left, Nignag. Probably thought he was dead. There's no reason you couldn't send a note to John Oliver, the doctor's assistant, offered Harriet. He'd come, I suppose, and charge for it, too. I'll pay a Mercer offered to their surprise. I shall hold you to that then, Ephraim said with an amused smile. Ty, help me to the curb. Harriet went to the desk, her desk and wrote a note to Dr. Wilcox's longtime assistant, a black man from Jamaica named John Oliver, and stuffed it into Ephraim's pocket as he and Tyree carried Nignag out to the trap Ephraim had accepted as a loan from one of the of his parishioners. 
Ephraim drove to the rectory, borrowed Father Brown's key, and led Nignag into the sanctuary. You polluted this place once before, he said. This time you'll sit here in the entryway. You'll be safe, you hear me, boy? And you'll be warmer than, you, than you'd be outdoors, so just be grateful. In a slurred voice, Nignag said, Jesus died for me? Ephraim was caught off guard. What's your Christian name, boy? Wilfred. Jesus died for all your, our sins, Wilfred, yours and mine. He died for me. He died for you. Ephraim expected Nignag to ask what he needed to do for forgiveness, but he did not. In the dark entryway lit by one candle, which Ephraim would soon snuff out, Nignag looked almost girlish. Ephraim felt a sudden compassion for him. He went to the basement where they kept blankets for the poor. Nignag was the poor, after all, so Ephraim tucked two blankets around him. He put his hand on Nignag's forehead and recited the Beatitudes. By the time he finished, the boy was asleep. Ephraim looked at Nignag, who was sitting with his knees drawn to his chest. He made the sign of the cross over him and hurried to return the horse and rig. As he was finally walking home, he felt a piece of paper in his pocket, the note to John Oliver. The Christchurch bell tower had gone 11. It was too late to disturb the old gentleman. He'd send a boy in the morning. Ephraim awoke early and went to church. Mercer stood on the steps waiting for him and carried a small parcel of food. He felt a wheeling irritation. Mercer was a celebrity now, and if, in Ephraim's mind, getting uppity. The Quicks, who regarded themselves as quite a special family, no doubt encouraged her to think of herself as quite a special fugitive. Morning, Reverend, she said sternly. Good morning, he thought. What a tone of voice. He looked at her squarely. You've come a long way since the first psalm in the cemetery, haven't we? Yes, sir, we have. He opened the door in the vestibule. Nignag had fallen over sideways. He was dead. Mercer insisted on accompanying Tyree to Nignag's room. She'd never seen that kind of filth she found in his alley. A man with empty eyes opened the door. The wood was rotten and warped at the bottom. Inside was dark, a stank of old sweat and waste. A woman huddled in one corner of a horse blanket, clutching a newborn baby. A man and a young woman sat on the floor with four children. Next to the window stood one chair obviously the place for the man who had opened the door for them. Mr. Quick, he said, sounding afraid. Mrs. Quick, how do? He nodded his head and shuffled. I'm not Mrs. Listen. We have, we was coming over to ask you about the place and to pay you, but since it was empty, I let my family get in and out of the cold. You don't mind, do you? You don't mind that. Who came and got Bobo and Jack? Tyree asked. I don't know much about the men who was kidnapped, he said. But they told me they was kidnapped. I don't know. I don't see it, except one of them was a bad N-word. Be my boy. There was no reason. While I'm out working, my wife was sick. Well, you tell anybody you know who knew Nignag. You know the boy? The skinny one? Used to bark? Yes, tell him he's dead, and he's going to have a service tomorrow afternoon, just past quitting time, over at St. Thomas. The man rolled his eyes and nodded as if they were paying careful attention, and yet Mercer was certain that when they left, he would do nothing but go back to sitting by the window. She'd seen his face when they walked by. Mr. Quick, sir, you got any work? You let me know. I'm handy with tools. The rent is half a dollar a week. And I'll come for it on Saturday, Tyree called over his shoulder. They probably told the kidnappers just when to come, he said, after they'd stepped down the alley and onto the street. You know these catchers employed colored men to go out and scout. Because the man beat their boy? Tyree shrugged. Could be, but he didn't beat them. And they wanted the room bad enough, and that's their story. Then they don't know how bad a thing they did. Could be. A man with a limp called after them, and they stopped and waited for him to catch up. His name was Jim Freeman. 
Tyree knew that he lived in the alley and had taken Nig Nag in now and then in the winter. He'd been beaten and routed in the raid too, he said. Did they do that to you? Tyree indicated his bad leg. Uh, no, sir. That's been that way for a couple of three months. That's why I'm still here. The other two was Midland, Midland Brown, Midland Height, Midland Leet. Everything, see? No limps, no marks, nor nothing. You described them. Could be described to anybody. Easy to steal, easy to sell. Well, sir, did you hear that right? The boy's dead and the funeral's tomorrow? Such as it is at St. Thomas. Thank you. It's decent for you to do it for him. Good day, ma'am. Nothing could be done about the kidnapped men, but Ephraim volunteered to give Nig Nag a funeral. It turned out to be a sorry affair. The undertaker wanted $10 to wash and dress the body and pump it full of formaldehyde. So they bought the cheapest box they could, they had, and paid him a dollar and a half extra to come break the bo body where rigor mortis had set it and stuff him into it. They kept the coffin closed. In addition to the Quick family, Jim Freeman showed up with four men from the alley. So did a handful of elder elderly church members who never missed any funeral. George from Blood Goods came late, dressed for work, and left early. Ephraim read from the Song of Solomon, Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raised thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought their, thee forth that bear thee. He had developed a habit of stopping in the middle of this text and looked meaningfully at the congregation. When he did this time, his last words hung in Mercer's mind. She had no idea what the passage was that he was reciting. She only knew that Nig Nag had no mother or father to mourn him, nor any family either. Who knew had, who had borne him or where? Who cared? What apple tree? Ephraim continued, Set me as a seal upon thy heart, as a seal upon thy arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which has a most vehement flame. Then he spoke about Nignag, referring to him as Wilfred and calling him eager to help, cheerful, and sometimes full of mischief. He mentioned in passing that Wilfred's will willingness to please had made him an agent of God's work through the Vigilance Committee. Poor Nig Nag, Mar Mercer thought. What would she have done without him? Love might be as strong as death, but who of the sparse group of assembled mourners had loved this pitiful young man? Had anyone washed his body or laid him out to cool before they busted him up and shoved him to the box? Then Ephraim admonished them to take the eternal life that Jesus offered because he is coming and we do not know the day because death comes to us all and we do not know the hour because he is coming because he is coming he promised he be back commit yourself to him happy I say are those who die in the Lord he didn't dwell too long on what happens to people who don't because no one suspected the broken body in the box at the rear of the church of serenity at the end and they knew besides that he might not be dead but had he not spent his last nickel getting drunk behind a house of house full of whores poor nignag mercer thought poor wilford god bless his soul